All right, now 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul's addressing an issue here in the church of Corinth where it says in verse number 1, it says it's reported commonly that there is fornication among you. So it says, like, it's not a secret. It's reported commonly. This is, this is out in the open. There's fornication in the church. And he says, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. He's saying, this is not even just fornication. He said, this is so bad that, you know, there's a man that's, that's fornicating with his father's wife. Right? I mean, that's, he's like, the Gentiles don't even do this stuff. He's like, they don't even talk about this stuff. Like, this isn't even something that they do. And this is what's going on in your church, and it's commonly reported. And this is in verse number two. It says, and ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned. So it's just basically this church has a, has a proud attitude. It's kind of an arrogant attitude. They're not worried about this fornication. It's not a big deal to them. And they're not dealing with it at all. It's just, it's just okay. I mean, this guy's showing up to church. They know that there's just open fornication going on with, with his father's wife. He comes in, and the people, it says, he says, you're puffed up. It says that he that, that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Now what we're going to be preaching about this morning is sins that can get you kicked out of church. Because what happens here is he's telling them, you know, that the answer to this is to, you have to get rid of that guy. He doesn't belong in the assembly. He doesn't belong in the congregation. And he shouldn't even sit out and eat with that person. You, they need to get out. And what we're going to be covering this morning is is the different sins that we will not allow to have just openly in this church. And we can learn a lot of this from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's continue reading here a little bit. Because he says in verse number 2 that he that, ha he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. So he's not supposed to be among you. Verse number 3, For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. He said, Paul's like, I don't even have to be there I don't need to know, oh, well, you don't know these special details of this circumstance. You know, there's sins like that. There are no details. It's like adultery. People say, oh, but you don't understand. You know, my husband doesn't love me as that much, and I'm lonely, and I have all these things going on. Look, I don't care about the details. It's wickedness. Get that person out of there. Paul's able to judge. They, oh, well, don't judge me. Hey, you're a sinner, too. I'm a sinner. No. Paul's able to judge, and we're able to judge. The Bible says not to judge as a hypocrite, but judge righteous judgment. This is a righteous judgment. He said, look, that, that's not even named among the Gentiles. Get that person out of that church. I don't need to be there. I've heard about it. It's, it's commonly reported. It's wide open. It's not some secret. It's not one person trying to slander another. This is open, and everybody knows what's going, knows what's going on. That person needs to get out. It says in verse 4, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, look at this, when ye are gathered together, so when you're gathered together, that's the assembly, that's the church, right? When you come together, when you're gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse number five, what's his solution to this? To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Here's a member of the church, he's an open fornication, who's saying, look, you need to deliver that person unto Satan. They just need to be cast out, give, let Satan have them and deal with them. Why? It says, for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Some people need to go through, you know, when, when they're in open sin and they're puffed up and nobody cares, they're being bold about it. Hey, sometimes that person needs to be brought low and needs to be humbled and Satan just needs to go and attack them and, and, and bring them down. And... Um, and he's, he's, that's, his, that's his answer for the church. I mean, he's saying, when you come together, look, deliver that guy up to Satan. Kick him out of here. This is God's house. Kick him out into the world. He doesn't belong here. It says in verse 6, your glorying is not good. So, and, and again, this church, it looks like they had kind of a, a proud, that says earlier, they're puffed up. They're glorying. They don't care at all that this, that this sin is just going on and open in their church. He says, know ye not that a little leaven... Leaven it the whole lump. So now we start to understand, look, when you start, and this is one of the reasons why these people need to be kicked out. Now it's not every sin, we're going to go into this, he lists off specific sins. I mean, obviously it's not every sin because then nobody would be allowed to. We know we're all sinners, but there are certain sins that he said are bad enough 
that look, that's not allowed here. Okay, and we're going to get into those real briefly. But it says a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Leaven is what they use in bread. You know, it's the, um, the yeast or whatever to, to make bread rise. And, when, and I don't know very much about this at all. But I do know that like you only need to add a little bit. Just like a small amount. You have all this dough. You know, you're trying to make your bread rise. You only need like a small portion. And then it just kind of like builds and grows. And like this whole thing just, just grows and gets bigger. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. You only need a little bit to affect the entire, all of the dough that you're working with. So what he's saying is, look, a little sin, you bring in sin or you, and you're letting someone like that just be open and just, they're completely in fornication and it's just wide open. That's going to be infectious and that's going to cause other people to sin. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. People are going to see that. And think about it, it only makes sense. If you see someone... And they're just living a, a totally wicked lifestyle, and, they're, and they're, it's just wide out in the open, and nothing bad ever happens, no consequences, there's no problem with it, and everyone just ignores it. Well, people are going to start thinking, oh, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm just, well, who cares? You know, I'm just going to keep living and doing whatever. It's, it's not as big of a deal to just live in sin. Why not? I mean, this guy's doing it, and no one seems to care. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. It's going to affect other people. That's why he says in verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven. He said, get rid of it. That ye may be a new lump. And again, ye, he's talking to a group of people. It's not just talking about one person. As ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's saying, look, you are unleavened. If you are, you know, you are saved, you've been washed through Jesus Christ. Be a new lump and don't, don't go back to that old leaven. You need, and this is something that we all need to do personally in our lives, anyways. Purge out the old leaven, purge out the sins from your life. But in this context, he's talking about purge out, I mean, those people who are who are living in that wickedness. Get them out of the church because you don't need them infecting the rest of you with his sinful lifestyle. And it says in verse number nine, it says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. So it's like I told you before, look, don't be hanging around with fornicators. And as a Christian, that should not be your friends. If you know people are fornicators, and, and it doesn't even, you know, even if they're not in a church, right? I mean, he's just talking about here, just don't company with fornicators. It's a, just a strict rule. It's not even talking about, well, yeah, but they don't go to church, they're unsafe. Well, look, don't company with fornicators. But then he says, but he says, he goes on to clarify that a little bit. He says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must you needs go out of the world. She's so saying, look, I know you're going to have contact with these people. You know, I'm not telling you just completely separate from every single person in the world that because if you're out in the world, you, got, you have the fornicators, you have the covetous, you have the extortioners, you have these idolaters, you have, you have all these people that are out there. He's getting real specific. He says in verse 11, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. And this is a list that, that we're going to use in this church to have with such an one, no, not to eat. We're not going to keep company with people that are doing this. Now look, it's important to notice it says, if any man be called a brother. Obviously, when people get saved, when people are, are just brand new to church, brand new to everything, they just put their faith in Christ, hey, there's going to be a lot of sin in their life still. Most likely. I mean, when someone just be, get, gets saved, yeah, they're a brother in the sense that they're born again, but they're not really called a brother. You know, like when you go to church, it's, hey, Brother Richard, Brother Sebastian, you know, like like people who have, who have been coming to church for a long time and, you know, they're kind of established. You know them. They're known in the church. They're people who are living righteously, living right. That's someone who's called a brother. When when you get someone, though, like like if I just got someone saved yesterday on Soul Winning and they came to church and they're living with their boyfriend or girlfriend and they're living in fornication, like you have to give that person time to grow. They have to be able to, to hear and understand and, and be able to make changes in their life and say, oh, okay, that's wrong. I'm going to listen to God's word and I'm going to do what's right. 
And people need to have time in order to grow. But he's talking here about people that are called a brother. I mean, this is someone that, you know, like if anybody that you know, I mean, and you know what this is. I don't need to, to, to define it just, just down to the letter of like, well, this is exactly what you would call a brother. You know who it is. You know people that have been going to church for a while or that they know this stuff. They're aware of what the Bible says. But what it really is is, is, is an attitude, right? And, and this exhibits a, a certain type of an attitude, which is, which is wicked. Because this is people who know God's word. They know the truth. They know what's going on. They know these are wicked sins, yet they decide to do it anyways. And, you know, and, and like in this case, they're not even ashamed about it. They're just going to do it openly. So get that person out of the church. Now, real briefly, we'll go through this list a little bit. So it says, you know, a fornicator is obviously someone who's having um, relationships with the, with the opposite gender um, before they're married. Right? That's what the fornication is. So someone living with a boyfriend, girlfriend, look, if you're coming to church for a while and you're still living like that, we're not going to have that, that open fornication in our church. If you, if, you, if you know it's wrong, if you've been here for a while, you, you know, it's, it's not something that's going to be allowed here. It's not an example that I want my children to see. And it's not an example that any other believer should be, should be watching and, and looking at and saying, oh, well, this must be okay. And ultimately, it's going to fall on the, on the responsibility of the pastor. You know, the pastor is the one that's going to need to step up and say, hey, look, we're not going to have this in our church. And it's not a fun thing to do. It's not something you're like to do. Because sometimes you'll see people, you're like, man, I, you know, and I know the heart, I know the heart that I have. I want people to, to really just to grow and to try to stay in church and try to do as much as possible to get people to stay in. But at the same time, you have to have some kind of standard where you're just going to draw the line. And God gives us the standard and say, look, I know you're sinners and I know there's problems, but when you have open fornication, that's a little leaven's going to leaven the entire lump. You might be thinking about that one person thinking like, man, if they could just stay in church, if they could just keep coming and just keep hearing the word that they'd grow. Well, not necessarily everybody is going to grow. Some people, if, especially if they have the, the wrong attitude and they just want to stick to that, to one of these major sins, you don't, you don't need that in the church. You don't want that in the church. Again, I'm not talking about a brand new believer, someone who just got saved, but people have been coming for a while and they're still continuing to do these sins. You got to get them out. The pastor needs to get them out of the church. They don't belong there. It's going to spoil. It's going to corrupt the entire church. So we know what a fornicator is. Covetous. That's someone who, who's looking at at stuff that belongs to other people, and they just have this. It's like greediness, and you want to have something that doesn't belong to you, and you're focused on the things of this world, and that's kind of what drives you. And you have this covetous attitude where you're just always wanting things that you can't necessarily get, and. Um, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. I mean, the root of all evil. All evil stems from, it comes from that root of the love of money. And the love of money is covetousness. That is what covetousness is. I mean, covetousness, it doesn't necessarily have to be money. It could be other things, other, whatever it may be. You know, covetousness is a little bit more broad. But the love of money is, is definitely included in that. And that comes from a covetous heart. And someone who just has that that mindset of just being covetous now from time to time any anybody might struggle with like one thing we're like look you shouldn't covet that right like man i, just, I need a new car that's different i mean it's still a sin and, it, and it's still covetous but it's not someone who's just who is just just labeled as covetous i mean someone who's just always like that with everything um idolater idolater is very similar to being covetous but someone who puts up something and that and and um, I mean idolatry, even in the Old Testament, someone if you have false gods, if you're, if you're worshiping like a like a false image, if you have these graven images and stuff, and you have and, and you have this, you know whatever this this um, you know, I think about if someone were to come here and like they just always had these these rosary beads and like this constantly were praying to that, just like had this this idolatry that. And you, and you teach on it and you preach on it, like, look, this is wrong, this is idolatry, and just, like, continue to hold to the idolatry. Well, 
You know, after sin too, the Bible saying, look, not to, and, and it's, it's serious. He says, look, I've written to you not to keep company. Like, don't, you're not even supposed to, like, fellowship with that person, which is why they're not welcome in the church. Because church isn't just a place to hear preaching and teaching, but it's a place for singing psalms and singing to other songs and hymns and spiritual songs. And, and you learn from the songs and you ultimately end up fellowshipping with the other people that are in church. A church is a congregation. It's not just a one-man show. We don't need to be keeping company with these people if they're called a brother. So we have covetous, we have fornicators, covetous, idolaters, a railer. Railer is someone who's bringing false accusations against people. And this is someone that'll just spout off their mouth and just say, oh yeah, so and so, and just and just bring all kinds of false accusations against that person. And that's someone who's they're basically a liar and they're just just bringing despite on the people in the church. And um, obviously, you don't want to have someone like that, excuse me, in the congregation that's just bringing false railing accusations against people. A drunkard. Again, I think everyone knows what a drunkard is. But, um, you know, if, you're, if someone's just giving alcohol or going out and a party and getting drunk every weekend, I mean, and again, there's a difference. I believe there's a difference between someone who will have a drink sometimes. And, I'm, and I st look, it's still a sin. You should, have, you should not drink any alcohol. I don't, you know, the Bible says that you shouldn't even look, look not thou upon the wine when it is red. We're not even supposed to be looking at it. But someone who has a few drinks sometimes is not labeled a drunkard. Okay, it's different. Someone who's a drunkard is a drunk. Someone who goes out and goes out and drinks to get drunk. And that's what they do. And that's what they like to do. And, and you could argue over, well... They only do it once a week or twice a week or whatever. But look, if you're just going out and you're drinking to get drunk, you're a drunkard. Okay? And if it's happened with any type of regularity, you're a drunkard. And it's not just alcohol. You know, the Bible says to be sober. I'm going to apply it to drunkard to if you're a druggie, drunkard, whatever it is. If you're out just going to get high, to, to not be sober, to just get in this other state of mind, you know, you're going to be filling yourself with wickedness. You know, your heart's going to utter perverse things. And the Bible says right here, don't keep company. So if that's, you know, if that's what someone who's called a brother is going to do, they're going to go out and do these things, you're not welcome in church. An extortioner. Again, you're holding something over someone um, and just extorting, you know, whether it be money or whatever it is, out of people. And that's wicked. I mean, these things are all really wicked sins, and we have to understand that they are... You know, I don't know if anything in this list may, might not seem that bad to any of you, but we need to understand that he's saying, look, with such an one, know not to eat. I mean, I don't know about you, I've had meals with lots of people before. Jesus had meals with, with, with sinners, right? When Jesus was going out, this is a perfect other, because we, and you need to understand this, he's not saying to go out from the whole world and just not associate with anybody who happens to do these things or happens to be one of these people that's just out in the world. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. We're trying to do the same thing. Okay, if you know someone, you have a co-worker, a colleague, or some acquaintance, right? He's not saying it's a sin to go and have a meal with that person. Again, Jesus Christ did the same thing. He had meals with sinners. He had meals with people who were doing bad things. And the Pharisees looked at him like, oh, if you would have known what that person does, you know, like, you wouldn't have anything to do with him. He's talking about within the church. He's talking about with people who, they're coming into God's house. These people are supposedly, they're brothers, they're, you know, they're, they're righteous, they're, they're, they're sanctified, and they're in church. These are the people that, look, they're going the wrong way. They're not trying to clean up. They're not, they don't have a repentant heart and trying to do what's right. They're doing what's wrong. You don't want to even eat with those people. And he says in verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. It's our job to judge in the church those that are within. And we judge them according to these judgments. And we look at these sins. He gives off these specific things that are just like, these are bad sins. These are major sins. He says, but them that are without, God judges. So we don't need to worry about the, the world. God's going to judge them. 
Okay? God has authority and he's going to take care of people outside that are fornicators and extortioners and all and all those sins. Look, God's going to take care of them. He's not saying that you have to completely separate yourself from all of those people all the time. He says, but within the church, that's your responsibility. That's your job. We need to be judging the people in there. He says, therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Okay? Now, when the pastor finds out about this, the pastor needs to deal with it and just get that person out of church. But if you know someone and it's not necessarily wide open, and you know someone's in these sins, hey, look, even just personally, even if you're in a church and a pastor doesn't do these things, you better keep yourself correct with this doctrine, with what the what the Bible's saying here. Don't you don't eat with that person. You shun that person. Maybe the pastor's not doing their job and kicking them out of church. And maybe it's not your job to make sure they're kicked out of church. But if you know this stuff is going on by, what, by, by someone in the church, hey, don't have anything to do with that person. Don't even eat with them. Don't do anything with them. They need to be shut. They need to be delivered unto Satan. And for their betterment, for the destruction of their flesh, but that their spirit might be saved, is, this, is, is what the Bible says. Turn, if you would, one... Um, one chapter over, we're going to see, there's actually, wow, studying for the sermon is amazing. I had a different plan on how I wanted to preach this because it's an important doctrine. And I think that these days, there's a lot of pastors that aren't, they're not following this. Because it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. It's offensive to people. You might have someone who's doing, who's guilty of, of fornication or whatever. And they might have some friends in the church. And... Hey, those friends in the church, they shouldn't be friends with that person if they know that they're in open fornication, but maybe they are. Maybe a lot of people don't know this doctrine, and now all of a sudden, if you kick someone out, a lot of people are going to be offended or upset by it, and you don't want to do that. Or, like I was alluding to earlier, you know, as a pastor, I can understand, hey, you see someone and you just you want them, you want them to change. You want them to grow, so you might think, well, what better place than in the church? Right? Well, I mean, where, where else are they going to grow? If, they, if they're not here, they're not going to understand. But look, there has to be consequences for your actions. And sometimes it just has to be dealt with. Um, it, it would be the same way of me trying to raise my children and never do it, never giving them any spankings and never giving them any harsh punishment because I think, well, if, if they could just understand my love for them, right? If they could just understand how much I love them. I can just keep on just pouring out love on them and just... And just get them to want to do what's right based on love. Hey, there's, you know, we ought to do what's right based on love. That, that is something that would be good. But look, the way that you teach that with people and what people need is not, that's not always the best way to do it. And the Bible will lay that out for you. That's why, you know, discipline needs to come. There needs to be consequences for our actions because that's reality. And that's, God has result, has consequences for our actions. And people need to understand that. And, um. We can't just, just step aside and just say, oh, well, I want to keep that person in church. Because if they're called a brother and they're doing any of these things that's on that list in 1 Corinthians 5, the Bible says, don't keep company with them. Deliver such a one unto Satan. That's what we need to do with them. And it, it ultimately is, and it may not seem that way, but it's for their benefit. Sometimes people just need to get shaken up, especially when you're proud, especially when you're living in the sin. You don't, they don't see anything wrong. Hey, they're coming to church. They don't see anything wrong with it. You know, this guy was doing this openly. He didn't see a problem with it. Well, guess what? If, if, if he's not, the preaching's not getting through to him and he doesn't see a problem with it, well, guess what? There is a problem with it. You're out the door, buddy. And, and maybe that'll sink into his head, which in this case it did. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, just one chapter over. Look at verse number 9. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? And there's a lot of passages, we're going to go to all of them that I found, that are very similar, similarly worded to this. And I want you to, to look at the sins that he lists here. When he talks about it, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. This type of statement is found in a few other places in the Bible. We're going to look at all of them, where he's talking about the unrighteous not inheriting the kingdom of God. But look at the sins he lists up. If you remember in 1 Corinthians 5, I'll read them off for you, what he said. He said not to eat with, 
He said not to eat with, a, with someone that's called a brother if they be a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, extortioner. Those were the ones that he listed off. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, he lists off fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, which is basically a fornication, but it's, you know, it's even worse, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. Like, all the same sins are found in this same exact list. He's saying, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 11. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of your God. So he's saying, look, the unsaved, people who do, you know, people who do these wicked sins, look, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. He says, but even though you were those things, because you're saved, you're washed. You're sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ. You're saved. But he, and he goes on to explain this. Now look at verse 12. He says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So look, you're washed. You're sanctified. All things are lawful unto you in the sense that you're, I mean, you're, you're saved from all of your sins. You're sanctified. You're washed. He says, but they're not all expedient. Just because you're free, just because you've been freed from the curse of the law, doesn't mean that you should just continue in sin and continue to do these things. He says in verse 13, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. So now he's going to explain this. He was talking about fornication. He said, look, your body is not for fornication. It's for the Lord. And when you go out and commit fornication, he's saying that, you know, you're making the members of Christ because he says your bodies are the members of Christ. When you're saved, when you're sanctified, hey, your body belongs to Christ. He says, now you're taking that member of Christ, you're a member of Christ's body, and you're making that a member of a harlot or a whore, right? You're going out, you're committing fornication, you're taking something which is supposed to be holy, and you're defiling it and just making that part of, of um, members of a harlot. Verse 16, what know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? you say, look, when you do that, when you commit fornication, you're becoming one flesh. You're becoming one body. So you're literally making the body of Christ, you know, defiled with the, with the harlot, as, as the Bible refers to her. For two saith he shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Verse 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Turn if you would to Galatians chapter 5. So he's saying here, look, he's really emphasizing how wicked and how bad fornication is, because a lot of people don't have a good idea about this, especially in today's world. I don't know how it was back then. It was probably similar, but... In today's society, it's getting crammed down your throat with music, with Hollywood, with all these, with all these places, all these sources. I mean, kids in, in high school are growing up and it's not a big deal anymore. Like there's just no morals being taught. There's no one showing you that, hey, fornication is wicked. Fornication is wrong. You're taking the body of Christ. You're taking the member of the Christ and making it the members of a harlot. Two, you know, two people become one flesh. He says, you basically, when you commit fornication, you're sinning against your own body. And your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. When you're saved, hey, God put the Holy Spirit inside of you. That Holy Spirit resides inside of you forever. It doesn't go away. God seals you with the earnest of the Holy Ghost. This Holy Spirit's living inside of you. And when you go and become one flesh with just through fornication with someone else, you're defiling the temple of God. Your body has become that temple because God is residing inside of your body. 
You're not your own. He's bought you with a price, with the, with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a very expensive price. He's bought you. He's bought your body. He's bought your soul. You belong to God. What are you doing going and taking the temple of God and just defiling it with a harlot? See, so this is the understanding that we need to have with fornication, and this is the reason why it's not allowed in church. It's a slap in the face to God to have God's people come together and have somebody in fornication, just open fornication, just becoming in his house and being part of the church like it's not a big deal and everyone just looking the other way. The Bible says that's wickedness and they need to be cast out. Galatians chapter 5. Look at verse number 16 of Galatians chapter 5. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's great advice right there. I love that verse. He said, look, if, you have, if you're struggling with sin, if you have problems with the lust of the flesh, different sense, hey, just walk in the Spirit. Don't focus so much on, man, how am I going to get the sin out of my life and just focus on that sin so much. Hey, if you're walking in the Spirit, if you're doing what's right, you're not going to walk in the flesh. You're not going to even have to worry about those things. If you're, if you're trying to figure out, man, how am I going to get rid of the sin in my life, Read the Bible more. Go out soul winning more. Just do, just do more things that's going to put you in the spirit. You won't do the, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're, if you're constantly walking in the spirit, it's impossible. You can't walk in the spirit and the flesh at the same time. It's one or the other. You're either walking in the spirit or you're walking in the flesh. And I understand it's a daily battle, but he's saying, look, you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. Spirit, look, it's, that's why it's impossible. You can't be walking in the spirit and the flesh, one or the other. You're either walking in the spirit or you're walking in the flesh. They're contrary to each other. So that you cannot do the things that you would, but if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Now look at this list again. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry. We saw that one earlier. Witchcraft. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, verse 21, envyings is covetousness, right? Murders, drunkenness, we saw drunkards, revelings and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Again, just as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 5, I said, look, the people that do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look, turn to Ephesians 5 if you would. We're going to see a similar list. Ephesians 5. We have 1 Corinthians 5, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5. All cover the same topic. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start reading verse number 1. Now, he brings this up, and I think it's important. He says, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Look, we know that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and that, and that you're sanctified and washed from all of your sins. And he's, and he's always careful to, to mention that in all of these passages because what the work salvation crowd would like to do is they'll try to point to these and say, see... If you do these sins after you're saved, you're not, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to go to heaven. Okay? And it's, and it's wrong. And that's why in, in all of these passages that we see so far, he's always clear to say, look, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. And we're saved by faith. You know, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you be led of the Spirit, like I said in Galatians 5.18, ye are not under the law. He's careful to put that in there so that we don't have confusion and we don't misunderstand what he's trying to say. But what he's doing, he's bringing correlation. Look, these are all things, these are all sins of the world. These are all things that are just going to condemn people to hell. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. The reason why you're not those things anymore is because you've been washed, because you've been sanctified through the blood of Jesus Christ. But look, that doesn't belong in the church. These are, the, these are the things they bring up. Adultery, fornication, idolatry, drunkenness, extortions, envyings, covetousness, all this stuff. That doesn't belong in here. The people that aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God, that's, that's for them to do. That does not belong in the church of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 1. But ye therefore, followers of God, as dear children, 
and walk, be ye therefore, sorry, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. And look at this again, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. So you're saints, you're sanctified, you're in the church. Don't even let these sins be named among you. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, right, that would be a fornicator, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, so there is he's equating covetousness with idolatry, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Again, I mean, it's, it's a strong admonition saying, look, the people that do these things, they have no inheritance of God. They don't, they don't have, they're not going to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6, let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So because of all these things, look, the wrath of God is going to come down on these people because of all of these sins. That's not something that you should just look at in church and be like, well, that's okay. I mean, he's saved. He's, you know, Christ washed him from his blood, so it's not a big deal. We're all fine here. Say, look, the wrath of God is going to come down on these people who are going to be burning in hell forever because of these sins. Don't allow this stuff in the church. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. Verse 7. Don't indulge in that. Don't be partakers with the children of disobedience. Verse number 8. For, we, for ye were sometimes darkness. But now are ye light in the Lord. Again, he's always, every time he brings up, he's always careful to explain this. Look, I know that you're saved. I know that you were sometimes darkness, but now you're light. Now you've been sanctified. Now you've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. But he says, walk as children of light. Because we still have that choice of how we're going to walk. We are children of light. We need to walk as children of light. We need to do those things. The children of darkness, the children of disobedience, they're already doing those things. They're going to keep doing those things. But you shouldn't. And he says, you've been washed from that. I know you're children of light, but you need to walk as children of light. We can't let the world just become part of the church. That's not for us. That's not for God's people. And we're going to put a strong distinction between these wicked sins and what a Christian is and what a Christian should be and what's allowed in God's house. It says in um, verse number 9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Okay? Don't just accept it. Don't have fellowship and, and just... And just everything's fine. No, you need to reprove them, which means tell them, that, tell them that they're wrong. Hey, you shouldn't be living in fornication, buddy. Hey, that's wicked. I'm not even going to eat with you. You're doing some pretty wicked things. I'm not going to have anything to do with you. It says, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. It's a parallel passage for Ephesians 5. Colossians 3. And again, we're covering the same thing. Because I want you to see how many places this is brought up in the Bible. It's not just, it's not even just in this one place. This is, a, this is something that's repetitive. This is something that's taught over and over and over and over again. We need to get it drilled into our heads how wicked these sins are. And don't just get this attitude that because we live in a wicked world, and because so many people are doing these things, that you just let yourself think that it's not that bad. Because it is. It's wickedness. Look at Colossians 3. Look at verse number 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Again, very clear, making sure, look, when Christ shall appear, then sh shall ye also appear with him in glory. You're saved. But, verse 5, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. 
For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Again, we're seeing the fornication, we're seeing the covetousness, we're seeing the idolatry, we're seeing these wicked sins. The same exact thing that we're being admonished in 1 Corinthians 5, that we should not allow that stuff in our church. Verse 7, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. They say, look, I know that you also did these things. It says, but, verse 8, now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. Turn to Hebrews 12 real quick, if you would, and try to get all this in. So we see how often these sins are just repeated. Where we started off, fornication, covetousness, idolatry, railer, drunkard, extortioner are the ones that he listed off. But these other sins that are being listed in these, in these other lists are also extremely wicked. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, look at verse number 5. So then ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now look, when someone gets kicked out of the church, it's a chastening. Okay, it's something that they need. It's a rebuke. It's something that they need to hear. And it's, you know, the Bible saying that when you get chastened of the Lord, it says, first, don't despise it. Have the right attitude. Now, God forbid that anyone here would fall into any of these one, any of these types of sins, right? God forbid. But if it were to happen and you were to get kicked out of church as you ought to, because you start, you, you start getting into to whatever these things are that are wickedness and we, and we shouldn't be a part of. If that happens to you, first of all, don't despise that. Don't be angry. Don't be hateful because, oh man, I can't believe they kicked me out of church. Blah, blah, blah. You know, like, don't have that attitude. It says, nor faint when thou rebuked of him. It says, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. The chastening becomes out of love. And a lot of times it's not that clear when you're going through it. But you need to understand that, that that's why it happens, and that is exactly why we would have to kick somebody out of this church. It's because ultimately we love that person and we just want them to get right with God. And we can't allow it to continue in our church. We can't allow it here. They might just need something, a swift kick in the pants to just say, look, you need to go get right with God. Don't despise the chastening. It says in verse 8, but if ye be without chastisement, if nothing happens, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So these churches, these people who are not rebuking these types of sins that the people need to be cast out, they're treating them like bastards because they're not being chased and they're not being rebuked. Verse number 9, furthermore, we have had fathers of the flesh which corrected us and gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised by us. So you say, look, it doesn't seem to be very, very joyous when you're going through it. When you're being chastened, when you're getting that spanking, so to speak, it's not, it's not, it's not a fun time. It's not joyous. He says, but... Afterward, it's going to yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised of your body. Later, you'll understand. Later, you should get it as long as that, that correction sinks in and you take that correction to heart and make the changes necessary. Verse number 12, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So again, there's this root of bitterness that, that, you, that you don't want to have spring up inside of you. 
And, and the bitterness can come from receiving a correction or a rebuke, but you don't want to be bitter against that. And, um, and it says, and thereby many be defiled. When you get bitterness in your soul, even in general over whatever it is, the Bible says many people get defiled. That bitterness is going to come out and it's going to hurt other people in other ways. You shouldn't have that bitterness. Verse number 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau wanted to have that blessing. If you remember when he was going to, um, to Isaac, and um, Jacob had already received the blessing. And he's like, don't you have a blessing for me, even for me, Father, you know. And he, and he had his tears, and he really wanted, and he really desired it. He says, look, he was rejected. He found no place of repentance. And this is something that we need to have. When, when, we, have, um, when we have sin in our life, you know, if someone is a fornicator, if someone does do things like that, they need to repent. They need to get right with God. They need to stop doing that so that they can receive the blessing. Because you can come back. Like, look, it's a horrible, wicked sin, right? You need to repent of that. You need to have the right attitude. You need to take the chastening. You need to take the rebuke. You need to take whatever the punishment may be let it sink down, correct your heart, get right with God, and repent. And, and come back. And now here's the last part I want to point out. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Because hopefully this doesn't have to happen here, but it might. Well, I mean, one day it might happen. It probably will. It'll probably happen because just... If enough people come through here, someone's going to get into this wicked sin. You know, we're going to try to prevent that from happening. We're going to try to edify each other. We're going to try to build each other up and exhort each other and keep each other from, from falling into these wicked sins. But if it happens, there's one thing that, I, that I'm going to do. They're going to get kicked out of church. If it's a brother and they falls into, if they have some wicked sin that we see in the Bible here that is being listed off, that we can't allow, that we're not supposed to eat with, that we're not supposed to company with, that we need to put away from among ourselves, we're going to do it. But here's the thing. If that person ends up repenting, if that person changes their ways, and they stop doing whatever it is that they're guilty of, they're going to be welcomed right back into this church. We're going to let them come right back in. We're not going to hold it over their head. If they were a fornicator in time past, if they needed to get kicked out of this church, hey, that's not something that we're going to be bitter about them against. We're going to be welcoming them back in and saying, good, good to see you, brother. Thanks for coming. You know, like we're, just, we're happy to see you. You don't have to bring up the past to them. You don't need to rub their face in it. We don't want to make them feel like they can't come back because they're ashamed. Look, if they get right with God, they're going to come right back. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, because this is what happened. We saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul's addressing the problem. He's saying, look, you need to keep get this person out of your presence, get him out of your sight. 2 Corinthians, his second letter of the Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 6, he says, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. He said, look, the punishment was sufficient. Many people inflicted it. He said, that's enough. It, like, it was sufficient, and what you did was enough. Verse number 7, so that contrary-wise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Okay, we need to have that forgiveness. Yes, the sin needs to be dealt with. Yes, it needs to be rebuked. Yes, it needs to be handled appropriately. But at the same time, when it's handled, it's forgiveness. Because God does the exact same thing with us. Look, when you have sin in your life, God's going to chasten you. He's going to discipline you. And he's going to forgive you. And that's what we ought to have too, is that forgiveness. You can't be holiness in your memory and, and keeping it back and, and just, just holding it over someone's head. Look, forgive them. Verse number eight, wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, 
I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes, forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage over us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So he said, look, if you don't have this forgiveness, like in the person of Christ, if you don't have this forgiveness, Satan can get an advantage over you. He's going to use it against you. It's not, you know, we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. He's going to use that to, to, you know, to bring this person, you know, with, get swallowed up with over much sorrow. But also, you know, you don't want to have a church of people aren't forgiving. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a terrible attitude to have. And I can see where sometimes you might get caught up with that, too. A lot of people who love the hard preaching, they want to hear the hard preaching on sin. You know, get that wickedness out of here. Don't let your heart get too hard with that. Where you don't have the proper love and forgiveness as well. You need to have the balance. Yes, we need to deal with sin appropriately. Yes, people are going to be kicked out of the church. But at the same time, hey, don't, don't let that label that person forever. We need to be able to just forget and say, okay, hey, they were punished. They're repentant. They're back with God, right with God. Hey, they're back in this church. They're a brother again. Everything's great. Not even going to be mentioned to him again. Water under the bridge is gone. We don't need to have that bitterness springing up in our church. And especially, hey, look, if someone does you wrong, maybe someone does you wrong in the church. And maybe it's one of these sins that and they, they need to get kicked out. And you're still here. They come back. You need to forgive that person. You need to let it go. You can't be holding a grudge against people if someone's done you wrong. We need to have this forgiveness. The last person, we're, last place we're going to turn, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Just flip a few pages over to chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. It says in verse 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. So as Paul explained to him, look, with 1 Corinthians, with the letter that he wrote to him, he made him sorry. I mean, they were grieved because... Paul's kind of ripping into him. He's, you know, he's ripping their face and saying, look, you have this wickedness. I don't even have to be there. I've judged this guy already. And there's a bunch of other things going on as well. It wasn't just this one instance. But, I mean, as in one instance we were looking at, he says, though I made you with a sorry, I do not, made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. He says, though I did repent. So back then, like, after he wrote the letter, he's probably thinking, like, man, was I too harsh on him? You know, like, maybe I shouldn't have written that to him. But he's saying, look, now, he's like, I don't repent. He said, then, yeah, after I wrote it, I did, but, but I don't. It says, for I perceive that the same epistle, that, that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. So it made you sorry, but it's only temporary. It's only for a season. Verse number nine, now I rejoice that you were made sorry. Now I'm happy that that made you sorry. Why? But that, he said, <laughs> sorry. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry. He's saying that I'm not rejoicing now because you were sorry. He said, not that you were made sorry, but that he sorrowed to repentance. So he said that, that the reason why he's rejoicing is not that because that he made them feel bad, but that he made them feel bad so that they could repent, so that they did end up getting the change. They did get right. They did listen to what he had to say. They listened to the rebuke, and they took it. That's why he was, he was rejoicing. He says, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. When you do wrong, you ought to be sorry for it. You ought, you ought not to, you know, a lot of people have this thing, they'll say, no regrets. Right? People say, oh, no, I don't have any regrets. I do things wrong and whatever. Like, it's just basically they're saying like, well, if you just do something wrong, just, well, whatever. I did something wrong, it's not a big deal. We ought not to have that attitude. Hey, having a regret is a good thing to do. Now, you shouldn't dwell on it for the rest of your life. Okay, you shouldn't just constantly be focused on that. But you ought to be sorry about it. You ought to have regret and, and let that regret be a, a godly sorrow that turns to repentance so that, hey, you don't do that anymore. Because once you change, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Now, now you can say, I'm done with that. I'm not going to dwell on it. But it needs to change you. You need to change your heart. You need to change your attitude. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. <coughs> it says, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Verse number 11. For behold, the selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sword, that what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what 
fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So he's, 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 he's getting excited here and he's saying all these things that, look, ye sorrowed after a godly sort and, and look what it did to you. Look at what that godly sorrow did. Look at the, the result of that, the fruit. He says, look what carefulness it wrought in you. So now they're thinking a lot more carefully. They're thinking like, wow, are we doing things according to God's word? Are we living what, the way that, that what's right? He says, what clearing of yourselves. Hey, we're getting right with God. We're going to clear up these issues. We're going to take care of them. We're going to settle them. Even though we've done wrong, we're going to clear it up right now. He says, yeah, what indignation, yeah, what fear, the proper fear of God, not having this proud, haughty attitude that they had of just, there's all this open sin, and they didn't care. It was, it was, just, it was just a puffed up attitude. You have the proper fear of God, you will not have that puffed up attitude. Yea, what vehement desire. Now all of a sudden, they, you know, they, they really cared. They, they, they got zealous and, and were dedicated to just doing things right. And setting the record straight and just doing everything that's right. It says, in all things, you have to prove to yourselves to be clear in this matter. So what he was writing to him about in 1 Corinthians, he's, now he's, he's, he's rejoicing. He's happy. He said, you know what? I'm glad I wrote it. It may have been harsh. It may have made you sorry. I'm not glad that you made sorry, but I'm glad that you changed. And you know what? That's what preaching is. That's what preaching is supposed to do. You hear something from the Bible. Don't, don't ruffle your feathers and, 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 and have a bad attitude about it. Have a godly sorrow. Change what needs to be changed. And move on and move forward and, and, and get yourself right with God and approve yourself. Verse 12, wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong. He said, look, I didn't do it for that guy. Nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. He said, I did it because I care about I care about your old church. I really care about you guys. It's not just for that guy or, or, or you know, the guy that did wrong or, or the guy that suffered wrong. He said, our care for you might be just going to look. We need to explain this up to you. You need to, you need to understand these things. The truth is, is is gonna is gonna resonate it's gonna get through and they, they needed to change verse 13 therefore we were comforted in your comfort yea and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus because his spirit was refreshed by law don't ever get a, a, a careless attitude about these sins don't ever think that, oh, well, and, and I hate this for, you know, <laughs> these churches have this, everyone's welcome here. Well, I'll tell you what, everyone is not welcome here. Not a word of truth Baptist church. Now, it wasn't in this list, but I'll tell you right now, it doesn't even need to be in this list. There's never going to be a sodomite coming to this church. They're not welcome. They're re God's already rejected them. They're rejected in the house of God as well. They'll never be welcome here. Now, these sins that are listed here, anything that's this extreme wickedness, if someone that's called a brother is doing these things, it's not going to be allowed here as well. This is not the place for that. We're here to fellowship. We're here, you know, like we're going to be eating with each other after service. We're going to be going out winning souls. Hey, if you're, you know, if I find out that people are guilty of the sin, and I'm not accusing anyone right now, I don't think anybody, you know, is, is involved with this, but if I find out that this is, you know, that this is someone in this church, they're going to be gone. But, don't forget, if that ever happens and, 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 and repentance happens in that person's heart, they come back, hey, forgiveness, open doors, we're going to receive them, they're a brother, they needed correction, and they're coming back. And, and, and we ought to have that attitude, whether it be with these specific sins and with the church or just in general with your life. Someone does you wrong, you know, hopefully they'll get right with God. But I mean, the Bible says, and personally, the Bible says that, you know, how oft shall I forgive my brother if he sinned against me seven times? And he said, you know, not seven times, but 70 and seven, times seven. It's like, you just forgive your brother. I mean, if your brother sins against you, you forgive him. And um, we ought to have that same loving attitude with, that's balanced with the, with the sharp rebukes that might be necessary sometimes. So let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. God, I pray that you would please help us to be able to do the things that sometimes aren't easy to do. Um, it's not always easy to just to say to somebody's face that, no, 
I'm not going to have anything to do with you. We're not going to go out to eat. I'm not going to commute. I'm not going to fellowship with you because you're living extreme wicked sin. And, um, and the Bible says that if you're called a brother, that you shouldn't be doing those things. And it's not always easy to make that type of a stand, dear Lord, but I pray to you, please just give us the strength to do what's right. I mean, your, your word tells us that this is the way that we ought to be. This is the way that we need to, to behave ourselves. And, um, and we need to keep ourselves pure, dear God, otherwise we're going to be in sin. And we shouldn't let other people, because, because of their own wickedness, get us into sin. And that, leaven, that little bit of leaven is going to leaven the whole lump. Lord, I pray that you would please just um, be with this church. God, help, us, help me to teach people your word and that we could prevent these things from ever even becoming an issue just from the beginning, dear Lord, that, that we'd understand and have a healthy sphere and respect for you and for your word and that we would never um, allow these, these types of sins to creep in and that we wouldn't, wouldn't backslide to this degree, dear Lord. But uh, I pray that you please bless our church and bless the soul winning this afternoon. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.